winding down. Everything that's been created winds down. Right now we're facing the end of summer. It's winding down with just a few weeks left before school starts back for parents and teachers. Summer's about over, it's winding down. Likewise, it's hard to believe now after 15 or 16 months, but our morning devotional series will be winding down soon. We'll end the week before Labor Day and then starting on Labor Day week, We'll begin our Sunday night Bible studies and return as best we can back to normal at Doorway Baptist Church. And so we're winding down. To do so, what I want to do for the next several weeks is look at what are referred to as spiritual disciplines. Things that God has given us, tools, or as theologians sometimes refer to them as means, means of grace. Things that God has graciously given to us to help us in our spiritual walk. We're going to look at several of these as we go. Some we'll look at quickly in just one video. Others we might take two or three videos to look at. And we'll cover as many as we can before time runs out. The one we're looking at today is just the idea in general of what is a spiritual discipline. We don't want to go too far. We don't want to go too deep yet. We just want to talk about the reality that this is something God has called us to do, that doing these disciplines, exercising these particular means of grace, are some things that we have been called to do. And so, if you have your Bible ready, go ahead and find your way to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4. I want to show you where we are, in fact, as Christians, followers of Christ, expected to do these things. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Now, the verse begins as Paul's dealing with his young protege, Timothy, warning him about problems in the church and avoiding, basically, troublemakers. He begins in verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Don't get sidetracked on secondary matters, which Unfortunately, if you were honest with yourself, most of the problems in most of our churches are minor things. We tend to major on the minors, not the things we really ought. So Paul tells Timothy, don't get sidetracked. Rather, middle of verse 7, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And that's what I want to focus on is that second half of verse 7. Don't get bogged down in all these things that have no spiritual, eternal importance. I've known of churches to split over the color of carpet, literally. I've known Christians who quit talking to each other over silly things brought up in one meeting about something that no one even remembers anymore what it was. Rather, Paul says, focus on what is of eternal consequence, godliness. And notice what he says here. Train yourself for godliness. Now that word train, it's by way of a command. It's an imperative, something we must do. So Paul is commanding Timothy and through this letter commanding us, this is something we must do. Train yourself for godliness. Now in your English Bible, the word train can actually come from two different Greek terms. One such word that is sometimes translated as train is the Greek word agonia. It's the word from which we get our English word agony. And if you've been to the gym, if you've worked out, if you've tried to get back in shape after years away, or if you've had surgery and you're doing physical therapy, you know exactly what they're talking about when they talk about agonia. Going back to the gym, getting back on the saddle when it doesn't feel good, when it hurts, when it's agonizing. And so you have to make yourself do it. You have to discipline yourself to do it. And so agonia is sometimes translated as train and would certainly fit this broader discussion of spiritual disciplines. But in this case, Paul chose a different word that we translate as train. Here he chose the word gymnasia. It literally is the word from which we get gymnasium, the place that you go to exercise. And so what Paul has in mind here when he tells Timothy and us, train yourself for godliness, exercise it. Work it out. Strain those muscles. Challenge yourself. Push harder and harder so that you might grow stronger and stronger. And so the first thing I want you to notice about spiritual disciplines as we enter into this study is that we are commanded to do it, even if it's going to be hard work, and it is, and we're commanded to do it with discipline in mind, forcing ourselves, training ourselves to go and do it over and over again, even when it doesn't feel good, even when it hurts. And so we're commanded to do it. Now, let's jump to the Old Testament for a few moments. Go to the book of Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter 23, in fact. Proverbs 23, verse 12. Here's another command. Proverbs 23, 12. Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to the words of knowledge. And so not only are we commanded, as Timothy shows us, to train ourselves to do spiritual disciplines, they're expected of us. Apply yourself. Apply your heart to instruction. You've got to make a conscious decision if you want to grow in your faith. You've got to make a conscious decision if you want to become more like Jesus. We can quench the Holy Spirit, we're warned in the New Testament. And so we must make a decision and apply ourselves to it. This is why Ezra 7.10, speaking of the prophet or the uh, scribe turned prophet in a sense in the Old Testament, the scribe Ezra says that he devoted himself. He set his heart to study the law of the Lord. And so it's expected of us that we'll apply ourselves to it. The pastor can't make you do it. The elders of the church can't make you do it. Your parents can't make you do it. Your spouse can't make you do it. You've got to do it. You've got to make the decision and apply yourself to it. It's expected of you. Now, back to the New Testament one more time. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Raise your hand when you find it. I'm waiting. I don't see anybody raising their hand, so I guess I'll have to go on without you. And so we're commanded to do spiritual disciplines, to exercise, to train ourselves. It's expected of us that we're going to apply ourselves to it. And if we're going to do that, we have to be intentional about these things. Let's read verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one receives the prize. So run that you may attain it. You've got to be intentional about this. Everybody runs. Everybody at church this coming week is there because they want to worship. They're there to be with other Christians. Hopefully they're there to study the Bible. Hopefully they're there to praise God. Hopefully they're there to become more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's not going to be easy. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's disappointing. Sometimes it is literally exercise. And so we've got to be intentional about it. Here, Paul again, uses the illustration that he often does from the Olympics and running. Run the race, not just the only the race set before you, like we're told later on in the book of Hebrews. Here we're told to run the race to win. The point of this is that the preparation is determined by the goal you have. If your goal is merely to get by in this life, to get into heaven, as they would say, by the skin of your teeth, you don't need to put a lot of preparation in it. If your goal is to show up at the race and take a few steps and quit, don't bother working out. But if your goal is to run, to run aggressively, to run competitively, if your goal is to run to win, you've got to train like a winner. For example, if you want to run a marathon and complete 26.2 miles, you're not going to go out and run 50-yard wind sprints. Now, you could do that, and it'll help your conditioning some, but it doesn't matter how many 50-yard dashes you run, it's not going to ultimately adequately prepare you to run a marathon. In the same way, if your goal is to become like Jesus, to train yourself in godliness, to be like him who is the perfect image of the invisible God, you've got to do the things that Jesus did when he was on earth. He studied the Bible. He prayed. He spent time alone with God in prayer and meditation and other such disciplines. If you want to become like Jesus, you have to make an effort at it. It's not going to happen accidentally. It's not going to happen by osmosis. Just showing up at church is not sufficient. Look around. There are enough people at church on any given Sunday who are no more like Jesus today than they were 20, 30, 60 years ago. Those are people who showed up at the race and they expect a participation trophy. They expect that God's going to pat them on the back and say, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for doing nothing to become more like my son. Thanks for doing nothing additional to glorify me in all that you do. Remember, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That takes discipline, and you've got to be intentional about it. You've got to apply yourself to the task. Run the race that God has set in front of you, 
but train and use the tools that God has given you to prepare you for that race. That's what the spiritual disciplines are. That's what we're going to be talking about the next several weeks. If you don't want to be made uncomfortable, if you're perfectly happy with the way you are, figuring that God will finish it all one day down the road, which he, by the way, does promise, and that you have nothing to add to it, sit back, go watch somebody else's video, listen to another podcast. But if you want to grow in the grace and admonition of the Lord, you'll take these spiritual disciplines that God has given us, that he's commanded of us, and you'll work at them. And I think you'll be amazed to see what God will do through them. Come back next time and we'll talk about the very first of these spiritual disciplines.